Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are wel welcome you, well, pleased to welcome you to the Initiate workshop on how to engage with fu future internet research. My name is Dana Elman. I'm an Innovation Delivery Manager at Digital Catapult. And I just want to give you a few housekeeping uh, notes uh, before we begin. So first of all, this is a Zoom webinar, which means this is, um, this is a platform where you, at the moment you cannot uh, talk or enable your video. This is completely normal. Uh, you will, however, be able to see the presenters and the presentation that is currently on. You'll be able to hear us. Um, the chat is disabled to avoid distraction. So please, if you have um, any comment uh, and, and question, please know that we, ha we have a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and you can ask us any question that you'd like. We will have a Q&A session uh, later on and it will be a great opportunity to hear your questions. The webinar is recorded. So it will be, and we will publish it, we will upload it to the Digital Catapult website and to Initiate website. I'd like to thank everyone who's participating today and uh, to the events team, Mary Vivier and Emma Davis, who are also with us hosting this webinar. I'd like to now present the agenda for today. As you know, this is a full day workshop. This is the morning webinar. Later on, we're going to have an afternoon session. The morning webinar, we have an exciting agenda for today. Uh, we're going to hear a welcome note uh, from um, Dr. Drithin Kalashi. Then we're going to have an, the Initiate Project Overview from Professor Dimitra Simonidou. Um, then we're going to hear the test uh, presentations from, from the universities in Digital Catapult on the testbed capabilities at the following order, University of Bristol, then University of Edinburgh. At 10.20, we're going to have a coffee break for 10 minutes. And then we will come back uh, and have uh, and continue the presentations with Lancaster University and then King's College and Digital Catapult. We'll then have, uh, when we conclude the part of the presentations, we'll have the Q&A session. After the Q&A, we're going to present the Initiate Portal and how to engage with it. And then a quick introduction to the afternoon session and the lunch break between 11.30 and 1 p.m. So without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome Dr. Dritin Kalashi, Head of 5G Technology at Digital Catapult. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dana, and uh, good morning, everyone. And um, it is with, uh, with a great pleasure on behalf of all the team of Initiate um, to, 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 to welcome you to this Initiate webinar which is organized by the Initiate Project Partners, as you heard, University of Bristol, University of Edinburgh, King's College London, University of Lancaster, and Digital Catapult. Um, today, we are looking to cover on how you can get engaged and connected with probably what is one of the most significant initiatives in the networking infrastructure research uh, in the UK, uh, funded by the um, Engineering and Physics Research Council, as part of uh, its framework for research and innovation for internet experimentation, which was launched back in 2016 and 17. The project started in 2017. The project idea was to bring together leading individual uh, academic testbeds across the UK into a joint national level experimental infrastructure um, for networking research. To develop this interconnection further and to provide open access to the academic community for networking and distributed systems research in the UK and fundamentally establish a testing and experimentation leadership capability in this, in this space uh, to test solutions for the internet infrastructure of the future. Uh, the idea at the time, which, which was very exciting for all of the partners, including Digital Catapult, was that more significantly to try to open this national testbed beyond the academic research community 
to providing access to these to uh, industrial companies, partners, and in particular, um, uh, small and medium enterprises, startups and scale-ups that could experiment and test innovative ideas for services and products, both within the network infrastructure and infrastructure management, but also on how they can use advanced infrastructure features of the future to prepare better for, for better products. We are working all together as in the uh, as Digital Catapult and the Academic Project Partners to develop what we call the sustainable engagement model for engaging SMEs with an academically led and academically delivered um, uh, testbed capability in the country. And this interactive webinar today will give a glimpse and will ask you how and offer help on how you can engage in this. It also gives me great pleasure that, uh, as it will be covered by um, uh, Professor Simonidou later on, and uh, Harald and Stephen and Costas, that initiate offers now, after two, two and a half years after it started, a single distributed test bed across the country, which can support complex uh, experimentation required in the future internet research. Understanding the behavior of the internet and its inherent complexities is, and scale is, is quite essential, but it is equally essential even for smaller scale experiments where people need to be exposed to advanced features of an infrastructure that is becoming a lot more agile and a lot more flexible. And the people that understand and can take advantage of that flexibility of the infrastructure, which comes through virtualization and software defined networks, and, and the management of the, and the servitization uh, and the orchestration of the services in the network. Whoever can pick up and take advantage of these kind of advanced features earlier than the others, then they can grow and ultimately contribute to what is the mission of the Digital Catapult to go and, 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 and support and enable further growth of the uh, UK, uh, UK uh, economy. Um, I wouldn't be serving Digital Catapult if I don't say very, very quickly that Digital Catapult is, is very, very proud to be a member of, of a such a distinguished academic consortium uh, as a leading digital advanced technology innovation center in the country, particularly in digital technologies. We focus on how uh, advances in um, generally advanced digital infrastructure, future networks and 5G, in IoT, in artificial intelligence, in immersive, and distributed ledger technologies, how all of these individual advances in individual technologies can be brought together to the benefit to be exposed, to be used and to be adopted earlier than it normally would have been by companies in the UK. And having infrastructure test beds that can be used by many people is a crucial tool in enabling this. Um, we will hear from Dimitra and from the other, uh, and the other members of the team giving access to the testbed is not sufficient on its own. What we will explain also today is what kind of technical support you can get in engaging with the testbed across the UK, in Edinburgh, in Lancaster, in King's College, in Bristol, and in Digital Catapult in London, and how you can work together with us. Our team has tried very hard to prepare a program today that works for you. Admittedly, it is a full day pro program, uh, but it has been built with, with very, very a ca a large care shown. Please work with us because uh, whilst we are thanking you and to joining us today in this interactive webinar, we also want to see you how we, we work, walk together in the journey of engaging with the testbed later on. And uh, without much, uh, much for further, further um, words, I will effectively pass back to Dana and to Dimitra to, to continue with giving the information in the morning session uh, which then we can use for the interactive session in the afternoon. Thank you very much. And again, welcome um, um, into the Initiate webinar. Thank you, Jitin. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Dimitra Simunidou to present the Initiate project overview. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dana, and uh, thank you, Dritan, for the brilliant introduction uh, of the overall purpose of the project. Uh, right. Uh, my purpose today is to give you an, uh, an overview of the initial vision and the purpose of Initiate, 
And we're supposed to be to meet all face to face on the 16th of March, but of course this didn't happen. So thank you all for joining today. As Rita mentioned, Initiate is a project that has been funded by the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, which is uh, a, a, a member of the UKRI. And the initial funding that we have received here is 1.6 million, complemented by much funding, almost much funding by our industrial partners. And you can see here that our industrial partners is quite a rich set of operators, vendors, uh, content providers, but also SME. So from the very beginning, we actually had a very, very uh, big focus on SMEs and how we can support actually innovation with the creation of this test, but not only academic research, although of course academic research is very much a focus of a project funded by UK research councils. Um, Dritan mentioned that the project started in February 2017 so it's a four year project and we have less than a year to go. And uh, at this point, we are looking at usage sustainability of the infrastructure and the tools that we have created to, uh, to move forward. Initially, the funding envelope was to either connect five test beds in the UK and the test beds are uh, University of Bristol, the digital catapult, the test bed is the digital catapult, um, King's College Lotto, University of Edinburgh and Lancaster. And you can see all the logos underneath in all of our slice, slices. And uh, uh, I mean, we, we have been a community of us. We always, for years now, we have identified the need to create an end-to-end -end large scale facility for future networks experimentation. I mean, Drita mentioned the internet. I will mention future networks in my uh, presentation because through these years we have actually seen a very very strong uh, trend within our community you know, of converting actually mobile networks with the internet into an advanced future networks concept. Our testament from the very beginning looked to take an opportunity of multi-technology uh, individual testbeds so we have included radio IoT optical data center and cloud and our mission has been to support the research and innovation for future network, as I mentioned before, before, and research and innovation spans from technologies to architectures to services and applications. Now we talk about a large scale multi-technology exper experiment, experimentation facility. And when we are looking at large scale at this instant, we are actually looking at a national scale. And of course, with the funding envelope that I mentioned before, you cannot have a national scale uh, fully equipped testbed. So for us, Initiate, what is delivering is a pilot and more or less a project that actually asks the question, what if? What if we had a fully equipped, you know, fully functional, large scale national testbeds, what could happen? And you are going to see some of the things that we managed to do already and things that we are planning to do in the future that enabled by this joined up national infrastructure. But the big focus of the project is actually to develop experimental control and user access framework to enable actually this experimentation to happen. And uh, you see a lot of test beds happening, not only in the UK, and all around the world. And my personal observation on that is test beds happen, they are actually being supported by a specific funding scheme that could be, you know, EPSRC, DCMS, or another funding scheme. It actually serves the needs of a consortium, but then when the funding dries out, there's no much legacy out of uh, coming out in terms of sustainable outputs of the test beds. And what we try to do here, and what you are going to see later on, is actually we have developed a control framework and technology for their connecting and scaling up test beds. A second one, we actually develop a user portal for easy onboarding of users. And when we, we say easy onboarding of users, our users could be a university researcher who doesn't need necessarily an easy framework to onboard. I mean, we live on test beds and we don't need really user interfaces most of the time, 
but we would like to open this up to user communities, to, vo to vertical sectors, that they're not necessarily actually network researchers. So our purpose is to show how we, with testbeds and tools like this, we can support collaborative research across UK universities and industry, across industry with industry, across universities with universities. And uh, the idea was, can we use actually uh, the testbed for technology and for um, use case, co-creation and co-development, and actually add into the overall uh, very rich uh, laboratory facility that we have in the UK. Uh, we engage with vertical sectors, so it's not only uh, experimental research, but also what a testbed like this could bring into vertical applications like autonomous system, digital health, cities, music, as you are going to see later on. And of course, we are looking, as I mentioned before, how we can scale up and support connectivity uh, across the UK. And we are now evolving to connectivity as well to international test bed. So we can bring ourselves in much wide, wider community, uh, which is beyond the UK for collaborative research and experimentation. This gives you the connectivity, the initial footprint, the picture of the initial footprint of this testbed. As I mentioned before, we are interconnecting already five labs. Uh, we have developed, and this is a big breakthrough for us, is the development of this exchange node, which allows this dynamic interconnection of virtual and of physical and virtual experimental resources across different laboratories. This consumes most of the effort in the project, and you're going to see more about this, but also initiate from the beginning did not stand on its own. From the beginning, connected to another infrastructure, which is uh, uh, created by a program grant from the same uh, partnership called Tucan. Um, it connects, it is going to connect more intimately with the National Dark Fiber Facility, which is also funded by, DCM, by, by EPSRC. And we have been very lucky, quite a lot of us in this, in this partnership, that we have actually took advantage for, uh, from DCMS and we engage with DCMS for the 5G testbeds and trials program. And we accelerated quite a lot of the development, not only of our local testbeds, but also the development of the exchange node through additional resources through the DCMS program. Our ultimate actually purpose is to create this open platform for external experimenters. So we see ourselves as the five universities, as the four universities plus digital catapult, actually to create a facility which would going to provide a service to the wider community for collaborative experimentation. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, key to our infrastructure is the exchange. And the exchange is a physical infrastructure, it's a node actually, it's a connectivity node, which we have established in, uh, within, and in, actually embedded within the GIC, the GIST infrastructure. And we, um, we have established it in the Virtus data center in Slough. And uh, what the exchange does, and I'm going to give a little bit more information in the next slide, is actually a, a light orchestration uh, capability which sits on top of individual test beds. So you see here, for instance, an example of the first experiments, the, the first connectivity that we have established, and that was between the University of Bristol, the Digital Catapult, and King's College London, and each of the test beds uh, that you are going to see being described later on, they have their very own infrastructure and their very own tools. But fundamentally, each of the test beds followed, follows quite a similar architecture with respect that we have converged infrastructure, radio, fiber, and a number of other terminals. We have SDN control of our infrastructures, and then most of us, we have deployed a man orchestrator, which actually is not necessary, but that's the approach that we have taken up to now in this project. And then uh, the idea was that we have actually established physical connectivity infrastructure across the testbeds through 
uh, this connectivity, and this at the moment is mostly layered to 10 gigabit connectivity across the test beds. And on the top of that, we have built a light orchestration service, which is sitting at the exchange, which is able actually to broker and compose end-to-end -end services across the test beds for collaborative experimentation. So what we have done across the whole consortium, we have least 10 gigabit per second disk layer two connectivity across all the partners at the moment. This connectivity does not necessarily need to be 10 gigabit. It could be one GBPS if actually experimentation does not uh, require 10 gigabit services. It could be if actually funds allow 100 GBPS, or it could be dark fiber connectivity in the future with a national dark fiber facility. And this is a very exciting, actually, uh, evolution for us because in the next months, the initiate exchange node is going to connect and be part of the national dark fiber infrastructure, which means that now we are going to be able to provide dark fiber connectivity services through our facility, but also more, even more exciting, we are going to be able to connect UCL, Southampton and Cambridge as well as part of the overall footprint of the initiate and then NDFF infrastructure. The interconnection facility, the physical layer at Virtus, is involves a layer two suites. The vendor that we, we, we engage is Corsa, and this suite is capable, capable actually for switching 10 gigabit per second, but also is capable for supporting 100 gigabit services as well, and could expand to, uh, to accommodate as well fiber ports. And we, at the moment, we have a server as well there, and we are planning, we are expanding to multiple servers, which is hosting actually uh, virtual resources, is uh, hosting management software, and it could manage VNFs uh, as it's actually orchestrating, orchestrating VNFs from different, uh, uh, from different uh, uh, test beds. Uh, this slide is giving you a little bit more information about the exchange itself. So you can see there the Corsa suites, uh, the 10 gigabit physical connections from all the test beds terminating in these uh, Corsa suites. Uh, the Corsa suites is quite an open platform, which actually is having an FPGA hosting, an open FPGA on, on within the 10 gigabit suites. And we have actually SDN control, our own SDN controller, which uh, programs the suites the way that we would like to configure it. On top of this, we have built ourselves within the consortium an inter-domain connectivity manager uh, which spans across all the test beds. And then we have a network service broker. How this works is that each test bed that actually subscribes to the initiate infrastructure at the moment is able to advertise a catalog of network services that is making available for collaborative experimentation. Now the exchange does not interact at all with the physical infrastructure of the individual test beds. It could, but at the moment it doesn't. And what it does is actually orchestrating these resources across this catalog of services that they're being advertised. And then of course is actually managing these virtual network services and is composing uh, end to end services for collaborative experimentation. So, our exchange at the moment it supports layer one, layer two, and layer three network services. What is very exciting is that what we have created is scalable. So, at the moment, it's hosting a number of test beds across the country, but definitely we see the capability to host many more test beds, and we can see capabilities actually to replicate in other parts of the country, this exchange infrastructure, and also even today it allows creation of mesh topologies among the test beds. And that allows for very, very exciting scenarios for future network experimentation. Oops. Right, so, uh, uh, this is another, another view of the connectivity. You can see the exchange at, at Slough and the interconnection at Slough. 
and you can see the different test beds that they are connected with their own characteristics and their own technologies that they are offering. I'm not going to go to the individuals because that's what the next set of presentations are going to do. But you can see here measurements of the round trip delay that we actually measured across the different test beds. And you can see that the connectivity at the moment uh, that is spans all the way from Slough to Edinburgh actually delays in connectivity. They do not exceed 10 milliseconds. So very low delay connectivity, which allows, of course, for the kind of experiments that I'm going to describe later. Um, we established the exchange uh, back, uh, the first instantiation of this exchange back in March 2018. And since then, we have performed a number of experiments. Uh, and I'm going to discuss two public showcases in particular, which they showcase the capability of this exchange. So I talked before about delay and we wanted really to test the delay, the end-to-end -to -end delay uh, capabilities of our testbed interconnection and also the dynamics of the orchestrator that we established as, in, as part of the, uh, the, the, the slow exchange. And of course, what is the best opportunity? The best opportunity to actually test end-to-end uh, -end delay is if we are engaging audio applications. So the first actual um, public demonstration we have performed over this infrastructure, it was uh, in uh, uh, March 2019, so over a year now, and that involved three uh, locations. It involved the digital catapult, uh, Bristol and King's College London, and we provided an actual, we composed a remote orchestra showcase which involved uh, musicians in the digital catapult uh, at Bristol, at the King's College, different musicians. We, have, we established across all the sites uh, less than 30 millisecond latency. Uh, the specific here is that we have actually, the, the connectivity was not nailed down, uh, wired connectivity, we used actually uh, the 10 gigabit infrastructure connectivity across these three places, uh, but with 5G radio ends in all the places, and we compose the end-to-end -end services, and we monitor and caradi this less than 30 millisecond uh, latency for the duration of the, of the showcase by oh. using our orchestration service and the 5G exchange. Oops. Actually, that moves that moved into another presentation, Dana. I'll I'll fix it. Just one second. Uh, if you go to the previous slide, please. Yeah. This one. Yes. Yeah. You can see a photo of this. Uh, 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 it needs to go to the presentation mode. Uh, you can see uh, uh, photos of this public showcase and you can see, for instance, you can see, for instance, musicians at Bristol, uh, musicians and vocalists at the digital catapult, and you can see at the back, Misa Dollar playing the piano at King's College. And I'll go now to my uh, next slide. And this is the second showcase, uh, which was inspired by the, the first one, but I'll tell you what the difference is. And uh, this was performed in June last year, so less than a year ago. And that is what we call the world's first 5G music lesson. What happened here uh, is that actually um, a charity called, in, called Music for All um, engaged with, with us and they asked if we can perform, if we can use actually our interconnected testbed capabilities and perform uh, the world's first music lesson wh which was to be delivered by Jamie Colum. Uh, so in this case, we had Bristol, we had London, the two locations again, so it was a uh, the Roman Amphitheater in London. It was the digital catapult 
uh, it was a digital catapult in, uh, uh, in London again. Uh, then we had a location with musicians at Bristol, but the difference here with what we have done previously, it was that we actually had another location which was at Birmingham and we connected the Initiate testbed, which is an experimental testbed, with BT's first release of their 5G commercial network, which reached Birmingham. Um, very exciting showcase, took a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, we had a, a public event and a lot of publicity out of that, but again, the combination of delays across the connections at uh, Bristol and London and Birmingham were kept below these 30 milliseconds. And uh, we could see how can actually, we had um, an experimental network connecting with a commercial network and doing this hybrid uh, showcase, uh, which brought actually industry and academia together to deliver really a first uh, world first experience over the networks. And I think I'm going to stop here uh, because there's a lot more to be described in terms of the infrastructures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitra. Now I'd like to present Navdeep Unial, Senior Research Associate at the University of Bristol to present the testbed capabilities. Um, thank you, Dana. Uh, uh, thank you, Dimitra and Dritan, for a very good overview. Um, um, myself, I will I will present the testbed capabilities which we have with the Initiate node at University of Bristol. So, uh, at University of Bristol, we have a multi-site testbed which is which consists of the central data center located at the smart, basically at the heart of the smart internet lab, um, and we have the testbed distributed across the city. Uh, so there are some public areas, as you can see in the picture picture below, there are multiple nodes. So the main central node over here uh, is the University of Bristol uh, data, Central Data Center. We have Vita Curious, that is basically a science museum in, Bris in like uh, the city center of Bristol, where we have deployed our um, uh, MEC nodes, edge nodes, as well as we have the um, uh, radio infrastructure over there for doing experiments for multiple different projects and even the public showcases. So some the public showcases which Dimitra mentioned were were hosted over here in the Vida, in Vida Curious uh, Science Museum as well. Other than that, we have this Millennium Square. So in the bottom of the picture, you can see that open square. So this is, uh, Millennium, this is the Millennium Square in Bristol where we have in all different towers, we have all the, uh, uh, all our radio infrastructure installed. Then we have, in addition, we have an M Shed Museum, which is another um, another public place where we have our 5G radio head um, installed. Uh, in terms of other capabilities, we have uh, deployed layer two optical switches uh, across multiple sites in Bristol. Um, basically, all these all these nodes over here and in the central data center, uh, we have internally in our in our HPN lab, um, we have FPGAs and P4 enabled switches where. Uh, uh, where we do our uh, internal experiments and even we use them for multiple different projects and demos and such kind of things. We have, uh, in addition, we have GPU servers to support AR and VR applications. Uh, so all the all the compute infrastructure which we have, they they are GPU. Most of them are GPU enabled, uh, which we can allow if some. If some uh, some SMEs or if some experimenters are coming into uh, coming into and hosting the uh, hosting their services at Bristol, they can leverage these GPU services and if they want to use them for particular AR and VR applications. Um, furthermore, as Dimitro already mentioned, we have connection to NDFF testbed and GN testbed and many other uh, testbeds across uh, UK and Europe. NDFF is something which as Dimitra already mentioned, we are going to get a node uh, connected to initiate and uh, we can experiment with that. Uh, moving further, I will talk uh, briefly about the radio and access solutions, which we have uh, in, uh, in Bristol. Uh, as you can see in this in this picture, we have um, the one in the yellow, the University of Bristol test trial license, that's this N78 band. 
um, which is basically the 5G radio band we are, we are, we are using as of now. So we have um, the radio, for the radio access, we have currently two kinds of, uh, two kinds of band versus licensed band and unlicensed band. So if there are a small group of experiments, so if you need only 20 to 30 users, we can use a licensed band, which is this N78. And, uh, but if you need something like um, a public showcase or you want a large group of people, say hundreds of people to engage for, for that particular, for particular experiment, then we will have to go to unlicensed bands, which, uh, which are provided, which are, um, which are provided like 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi bands. Um, so, uh, which, which is there in the bottom, you can see over here. So this is this is basically the uh, for, for the 5G. Uh, we have even the uh, we have even the uh, LTE uh, um, allocations uh, with us. We uh, have worked with BT 15 megahertz and uh, 20 megahertz in uh, in past. Uh, in addition, uh, for the backhaul, we are we are using 26 gigahertz band frequency, um, which is basically. Uh, with the capacity of 16, uh, 60, uh, 60 gigs, uh, which connect multiple different test sites, right? So um, other than that, we have multi-vendor uh, Wi-Fi enabled like SDN enabled Rukus Wi-Fi and uh, Nokia Wi-Fi, which are deployed across the sites as, uh, as I have shown over here. Uh, and one second. So which is deployed across the sites, as you can see in the uh, in the bottom uh, bottom of this picture. Okay, so um, th this this was about the Wi-Fi and uh, the radio access we have. For um, more than that, we have we have all we have uh, used some kind of uh, massive MIMO and uh, new radio demonstrators. Basically, in back in 2018, we used that these for uh, research uh, for basically for the research demos. These were these were developed by the by different groups at, at University of Bristol as well as the smart internet lab um, so this this was this was being this was being done and we can uh, we can provide you basically multiple different kind of options for you to engage with us and uh, use the radio radio uh, infrastructure moving on to optical network and the compute resources which we have at you deployed at university of bristol uh, we have a whole sdn enabled optical fiber switch network so uh, all the all the different sites over here the backhaul they are connected majorly through the fiber so the yellow link which you are seeing over here on this picture are uh, depicts the uh, depicts the optical fiber links which we have um, in combination, uh, these are these are um, operated or switched using the Polartis series 6000 optical circuit switches, uh, which are uh, which are again SDN enabled. So we can do the dynamic uh, allocation of flows across uh, different different sites. In addition, uh, we have deployed uh, Voyager switches, which are with a combination of uh, layer two capabilities and optical transponders, which have a high range uh, capabilities. And um, we can if we can do uh, that is basically uh, Voyager itself has uh, a big capability to interoperate both the optical as well as the uh, layer two network between them. Um, uh, as you can see in this picture, the fibers, uh, the fiber network which we have has a star topology, but we can always use them as a mesh uh, uh, network using the using the Wi-Fi uh, using the radio links which we have depicted with uh, the red lines over here. Okay, so um, that that was basically for the for the physical infrastructure. Moving on to the virtualization and the compute solutions, we have two two kinds of uh, virtualization and compute solutions deployed. One is through the uh, one is through the open source solutions which we have. Majorly, uh, if you talk about the NFV Mano, then we are using op open source Mano as uh, which is the HSI based uh, orchestrator, network orchestrator, um, and OpenStack as the underlying um, uh, VIM infrastructure. As well as we are using Kubernetes for um, for deploying containers on the edge nodes, these OpenStack VIMs are SRIOV, and as I already said, they are GPU enabled. 
in addition to uh, the open source uh, solutions, we have a proprietary solution by Nokia, which is Nokia CloudBand. And uh, Nokia CloudBand has deployed the, we have the Nokia EPC and non-standalone proprietary solutions from Nokia. Uh, uh, in addition to the MEC solutions, which, which again is uh, proprietary to Nokia and uh, we have deployed it in our, um, in, in our infrastructure. For the management of all the networks, uh, we are using two kinds of uh, SDN controllers. One is proprietary, that is uh, through Zeta networks, uh, that is called NetOS, and uh, another through using the open source solutions like ONOS and ODL, which are the major uh, SDN controllers we work with. Uh, in uh, while uh, whereas for the Nokia solutions, the proprietary solutions, we have deployed the NetAct and the FlexiZone, which are uh, again uh, Nokia solutions to to manage the proprietary Nokia uh, infrastructure. Uh, moreover, as I've already said, we have the MEC solutions, uh, both from Nokia, as well as um, the open source MEC solutions we have worked with, and IP service router, which basically is the main uh, point from uh, through which we engage with the, how to be engaged with the, Experiment as well, we provide the access through access their solutions. I will go through it uh, later um, during uh, during the session uh, when we talk about uh, talk more about the portal. Thank you, thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you, Nadeep. I'd like to quickly uh, um, introduce uh, Professor Harold Haas, Chair of Mobile Communications, University of Edinburgh, who's going to present the testbed capabilities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dana, for the introduction and um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us at the uh, Initiate Workshop this morning. In fact, a very, very lovely morning in, in across the UK. Um, so if we hear some uh, background noises. Uh, these are two kids that are sick of home teaching, um, or homeschooling. So apologies for that uh, upfront. So I would like to um, explain a little bit um, the uh, initiate testbed and our our contribution to that. So let me first start by um, uh, giving you my view about the opportunities that the uh, initiate testbed offers and provides. I see this as a bridge that crosses the, the value of death between TRL3 and TRL6, sort of proper prototyping and helping SMEs and the industry to cross that valley in order to innovate for the future across, across networking. And only these times now have, have shown us how important networking is. And, and um, I think what this testbed offers is a unique infrastructure to really um, move networking into the next sort of a, Decade, um, and that's that's a, that's an offer that we have. So hopefully uh, you will will engage with us in the afternoon session. So here in, in Edinburgh, so what we what we have, as you many of you may or may not know, uh, we have pioneered uh, sort of uh, wireless communications with light. So we're looking more or less at the access network and the and the network um, and 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 backhauling connecting um, the, uh, the access networks uh, to, the, to the infrastructure that, that uh, Nafdeep and Dimitra have introduced. And around that optical wireless technology, we have a number of uh, opportunities to um, basically um, extend uh, wireless networking. And what we see in the future, we see more and more that, that wireless connectivity is not, is not a commodity anymore. It is morphed into the application especially around IoT, around uh, AR, VR, where it becomes an in integral part of the application, especially in the, in the VR, where latency is such a big problem. So um, here is here's an overview of the test pair that we have in, in, in Edinburgh um, around networking with light, which is uh, succinctly different from point-to-point -point communication with light, and I really like to stress that. Um, so we, we have here, for example, a test bed. Uh, you see two uh, examples of two, what we call a light fire access points in a lab, but there are, there are more the entire sort of offices uh, or lab is equipped with these uh, access points. And they operate as a 
as a normal standard network. And obviously they are interconnected to an SDN enabled server and are interconnected to the testbed partners and, and also via, via, via the, uh, the exchange as explained by, by Dimitra uh, connected to the 5G exchange. So what this allows you and us is to test new types of um, algorithms around multi-user access, around handover, around cooperative multi-point transmission protocols, around interference mitigation protocols, about networking resilience. And there's a lot of work, theoretically work around these algorithms, but what we have here is a, a platform that would allow everyone to test these new algorithms around this new layer of um, wireless connectivity embedded into the, the wider sort of uh, access net to network infrastructure. And what we have seen and we've engaged with users in, 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 that, in that domain, especially in the defense, and uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've seen that um, there's a, a huge proposition around enhanced security when you use light as a wireless communication bearer, because light doesn't go through walls and therefore the man in the middle attack uh, that Wi-Fi often suffers quite heavily, it, it's, not, it, it's basically reduced, it's mitigated. So you could uh, build much more secure uh, systems. And, and we have engaged with the, with the US Army in Europe and they did extensive tests uh, around Li-Fi and, and found that the digital footprint is close to zero, it's zero actually. So therefore um, it allows new experimentation. For example, if you look at these Wi-Fi access points, what we see there is white light coming out of this but white light is composed of multiple wavelengths. So for example, in the most simple case, RGB, red, green, blue. So you have three different channels uh, that you could treat independently and provide different sort of sliced services in a multi-tenant uh, operation within, within such an environment. And what it also allows uh, us to do is to have a load balancing algorithms between Wi-Fi and, and, and Li-Fi and ena enabling this agility that I've described earlier when you morph the uh, wireless connectivity into the, into the actual application. What we've also seen is that uh, with, with the fine grained access point structure with the ultra dense network uh, setup, uh, navigation services, location based services are easier to accomplish. And therefore there's an, there's an ad additional information about where the users are. And you can combine that also with LiDAR so essentially what we do is we, we it basically built together net sensing and communications and that within one access point. But then if you extend that in saying we have computational com uh, capability with memory, so this allows us to build new edge computing, cloud computing, fog computing infrastructures. And taking this further, uh, we've uh, also I mean, engaged in another EPSRC program grant at house. We're looking now at terabit connectivity with light. So that allows uh, in, uh, indeed also a data center application around micro data center, dynamic data center applications of terabit optical wireless links. So that is, that is where we do the TRL3 research, but via this, this testbed, we want to translate it to, out to you, to the user communities. Um, so that is that. So we, we also, as I said earlier, we look into the access network, sorry, I, I somehow, seem to have pressed too much. Um, we also are interested in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the backhaul. And um, there's, there's one particular technology around optical wireless communication we have developed here. You see on the right hand side, this solar panel not only powers the transceiver that's in this gray box, it also acts as a de detector. It's a high speed data detector. Um, and, and this provides an energy self-sufficient transceiver that could be plugged and played into into outdoor environments. Here's, you see an installation of an outdoor backhaul on the remote island of Graham Sea in the Orkneys, uh, where we've quadrupled the data rate of, of users in, in that small island, where they then now enjoy sort of um, 4K TV, which they couldn't with their sort of copper network with gave them two megabit per second. So that's an application, uh, an example, how we engage with users. And that was partially uh, in, in, in collaboration as, uh, of, uh, in, in, in uh, DCMS funded 5G rural first project. So what else? Um, so we have indeed also um, developed experimentation and, and uh, test kits. So this is a TRL6 prototype uh, of a um, 
of a, um, a live by access point, a new one that would allow one gigabit per second transmission um, in, uh, in sort of in ranges up to 10 meter. In fact, we've uh, done tests here that if in, 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 a, in a backhaul setup outdoors, it would also allow up to a 50 meter um, if um, we further um, sort of de de deploy that, uh, uh, that system in, in, that, in that sense. Having said that, um, these novel sources that we, uh, we work together with an industry partner in, in, in the US um, also are capable of delivering 20 gigabit per second. And this was a demonstration um, that we did at CES uh, this year in, uh, in Las Vegas, actually my last uh, business trip. Um, so showing uh, really the cap capability of, of light as a, as a data carrier. And, and this, these boxes, as you see here with the, with the measure, they are fairly small. They're all developed in, in the LiFi center. And these are mobile and we can distribute them. We can um, sort of lend them, borrow them and engage with you out, out as users to build new cases and, and drive a new ca a use case development around, um, around connectivity with light. So lastly, um, I guess this is my last slide, um, the, uh, this extended tested capabilities that we can offer. And that is uh, taking, taking, a, taking sort of stock of the, of the advantages light um, is, is by building 20 gigabit backhaul system. And, and that was an, an all optical relaying system that, that, that we have in the lab and developed with an industry partner in, uh, in, in the aerospace uh, sort of uh, industry. And this, this backhaul is it's in an actual aircraft installed and, and it's working um, in a, in a mock-up cabin. Again, something we can take out uh, for experimentation. Um, the, I've, I've explained the FSO system with solar panels as data detectors, um, but also we've, uh, we've uh, developed uh, underwater test kits, as you see on the right-hand side, to build underwater meshed networks or also communication networks and complete infrastructures underwater. Uh, achieving sort of megabits of data rate and, and looking further, looking at gigabits underwater communication. Uh, in Edinburgh, we are fortunate to have the, the flow wave, um, which is a, a big sort of uh, infrastructure for uh, um, testing sort of a, um, uh, tidal energy, uh, but that, that also provides an opportunity to test our, our underwater uh, test kit. Um, so with that, um, I think I've hopefully given a summary of um, what we can do, what the capabilities are. I'd like to, to hand back to, um, to Dana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. We will now go um, to have a coffee break. Um, this concludes the first part of the morning webinar. I'd like to introduce Charles Waples, our very talented illustrator uh, and innovation coordinator at Digital Catapult, who is going to share his screen and show you during the break um, his, his amazing illustrations. I'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We are now going to continue with the testbed capabilities presentations. Thank you very much, Charles. I would like to now invite Dr. Stephen Simpson, Senior Research Associate at Lancaster University to present the testbed capabilities. Uh, thank you, Donna. Um, so uh, Lancaster is uh, here in the center of uh, Britain. Um, We've got a, a large bank of uh, rack mounted uh, servers running, running OpenStack so to constitute a compute resource. Um, it's about 200 cores and uh, eight terabytes of memory. Um, we've got a, a CHEF or, or CEF uh, storage service, which is for um, uh, object and block storage, which can support uh, the virtualization. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the computer resources have um, they have 10 gigabit uh, network connections um, and they're supported by a network of uh, Openflow switches from various sources, HP, um, of course, I'm, I beg your pardon, I, haven't, I don't seem to have control. Can you move me on to the next slide, please? Oh, that might be it. No, I don't seem to have control of the slides. You can just 27, please. That's it. Great. Um, and um, <clears throat> I thought I was saying, oh, Openflow switches. Yes, so we've got a network of Openflow switches, uh, HP, Corsa, and Pi 8, and possibly a few others. Um, and we've got some net FPGA uh, uh, traffic generation capture cards. Um, these these are all connected, can all be connected together. Um, and the, there's a data plane broker which uh, controls um, the uh, slicing of the Openflow switches. So you can create virtual slices, virtual networks across uh, the physical Openflow switches uh, and have some guaranteed bandwidth um, between them. <coughs> uh, Openflow is obviously for network programmability. We've also got some uh, P4 uh, hardware. Uh, from various uh, vendors. Um, so P4 is uh, a rival to uh, OpenFlow, it's a new technology also. Um, uh, a bit more complicated, a bit more um, sophisticated. Um, and we've got a uh, connectivity to the uh, barn uh, network, which is broadband for rural north. Um, so this is where uh, rural communities have laid their, their own fiber and uh, provide themselves their own uh, uh, high bandwidth internet. Um, so there's potential for, um, uh, that, uh, for them as a user base um, and it's possible to have certain probes uh, placed in that network and get some statistics from there. Uh, and this, these can all be fed into uh, Initiate. There's also a, um, a TV white space lab. Um, so TV white space is the uh, the leftover bandwidth from the move from analog to digital TV. And it's possible for um, uh, ordinary users to uh, use bits of that on an ad hoc basis. Um, so could I have 28, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, we've got, um, we're involved in uh, some smart grid projects. We've got our own um, wind turbine um, and we collect uh, stats from that. Um, uh, so uh, speed, direction, power, voltage, um, I think angle of the blades as well, something like that. Um, and uh, we're involved in, in projects where we're looking into the um, uh, monitoring, optimizing of generating uh, renewable energy. Um, so the, the, the data from the wind turbine that, that's available over in shade. Um, we're also deploying, uh, rolling out now a, a LoRa type two uh, network across campus. Um, so that's, uh, so we can do massive IOT experiments. Um, so yeah, so a wireless uh, technology, a long range one. Um, 
and the devices will be uh, Raspberry Pis with uh, um, LoRa devices in them, I think. Um, <coughs> uh, we've got a, a network of um, OPLO switches and P4 switches, uh, and you can do network slicing experiments on those with the data plane broker. So that uh, slices virtual uh, networks out of a physical network, uh, and those virtual networks are independent of each other, uh, both functionally and non-functionally. So you don't see other people's traffic, they don't see yours, and you get certain uh, cross uh, quality of service protections uh, from each other. So you, your volume of traffic shouldn't interfere with somebody else's volume and vice versa. Um, and then you can you, you use OpenStack around the edges of that uh, that network um, as the, the endpoints uh, which are generating and consuming traffic. Um, we've got a, a, a load balanced HA proxy um, implemented, which can be deployed. Uh, part of it can be deployed at Lancaster, and parts can be deployed at other initiate sites. So you can do um, caching experiments across the network. Um, you could have clients at Lancaster uh, using a cache. Um, at Lancaster going to resources at a different site or vice versa. Um, you can use use the computer resources generally as a, a micro data center, so that would be deploying um, application specific proxies and services for your um, geographically local uh, user base. Uh, you can see on the bottom right there, it's this is uh, the barn uh, people laying their fiber um, <clears throat> so there's a, a rural uh, a community broadband network there. Um, so that's a potential user base. And um, I said before, we can put uh, have probes in that network uh, so you can get uh, data from there as well. Um, finally, uh, if you need to tinker with anything, uh, we can arrange, if you've got uh, virtual machines set up, uh, we can arrange for OpenVPN access to those machines so you can uh, modify them and configure them um, and have lots of fun. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you, Stephen. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Kostas Antonokoglu, a research assistant at King's College London, to present the testbed capabilities. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dana. Um, so I'm Costa Sandonakoglu and I'm a researcher at the Center for Telecommunications Research of King's College London and I will uh, talk about the KCL testbed capabilities. Um, so uh, basically the testbed is located at the King's College London Strand campus uh, in the center of London and is composed of three main areas and spaces. Uh, First, uh, the KCL Tactile Internet Lab, where uh, in this area researchers work on experiments and use cases mostly related to the testbed. Uh, this is also the main area where we usually work on reconfiguring the testbed network when needed within KCL. Uh, and I will describe later on some of the use cases we have explored and what that and use cases that we are currently uh, working on. Second is the converged core network area, uh, which is uh, at the bottom on the right, uh, which is only accessible remotely unless there's special permission for someone to enter the space. Basically, this is our data center. Um, the 5G core um, of the testbed offers connectivity, computation, and virtualization capabilities. And uh, last but not least, we have the uh, rooftop where we have the installed our 5G antennas and uh, IoT antennas as well. Um, uh, now I would like to briefly mention what uh, the KCL testbed infrastructure offers. Uh, first, in terms of um, wireless access, we have uh, 5G new radios operating at 28 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz. Um, open air interface um, uh, supporting 4G LTE, um, commercial macro cell uh, 4G LTE, and small cell equipped, equipped with uh, Wi Fi uh, capabilities. Uh, and we also provide, uh, can provide test UEs. 
the, the, the testbed also offers virtualized run and mobile core network um, switches, which are SDN compliant and run with OpenFlow um, and open, optimized OpenStack deployment for VNF hosting, um, Kubernetes deployment for microservices, uh, which has been, this is the last addition to the testbed. Uh, we also provide um, a manual orchestrator design, um, which is applied to the current system. And uh, in terms of connectivity, uh, we have eight dark fiber pairs available for connectivity to the core. Oops. Oh. I think I scrolled down. Okay. Uh, to the core. Uh, 10 gigabps uh, fiber network uh, for external and industrial access links. And of course, VPN access uh, to um, reconfigure the network and uh, deploy uh, whatever we uh, want to deploy. Um, now, uh, I would like to just uh, show you a bit uh, the topology of the network where we have, uh, uh, this is basically composed of the three uh, areas I uh, previously described. We have the, the roof antennas, the antennas on the roof, um, uh, the 5G antennas and the LoRa IoT antennas uh, connected uh, either to the data center directly or the um, lab network. Um, and uh, the, the basically the use cases that we have explored in the past are were, uh, were regarding telementoring and unmanned aerial vehicle control. And currently we are pursuing use cases regarding remote diagnosis. Um, for example, using haptic interfaces. Um, uh, we have implemented telehaptic systems and uh, we are currently experimenting with these. Uh, as well as um, we are interested in use cases that uh, deal with uh, edge assisted or cloud-based AI applications. Although we're not necessarily restricted within these use cases, uh, there is a wide scope of applications that we can potentially accommodate. Um, so uh, regarding the available uh, testbed computation capabilities, um, we have compute nodes which are configured similarly with 128 gigabit, uh, gigabytes of memory and uh, two Intel CPUs with uh, 44 cores each. So a uh, total of 80, and we have an 88 virtual processors available, uh, clocked at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, we also have uh, three GPU racks um, that include two NVIDIA Titan 5 uh, cards which can potentially be used within the, the cloud infrastructure as well as uh, for NVIDIA GeForce cards which uh, are currently used for standalone computations. Uh, we also have uh, three haptic devices uh, like the ones in the, uh, in the picture on the left, uh, in the middle. Um, as I said, we, have, um, we are experimenting with telehaptic systems. Uh, we also have um, NVIDIA Jetson Nano uh, for some experimentation with uh, distributed um, computation. Um, and our other research teams, which we collaborate with, um, for example, have um, available medical diagnostic devices, such as the one on the right, uh, which, is de which can detect, it's basically a helmet that can detect uh, um, brain strokes. Uh, and we also have equipment for uh, VR applications as the Vive Pro VR headset. Uh, thank you. This is it. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Kostas Katsaros, Senior 5G Technologist at Digital Catapult to present the testbed capabilities. Hello. Thank you, Dana. Uh, my name is Kostas Kasaros. I'm a senior 5G technologist with uh, Digital Catapult, and I'm going to present the capabilities that we have uh, and have interconnected with Initiate Testbed. So, I can go to the next slide. So, Digital Catapult uh, 5G Testbed facility is a three site facility spanning uh, basically in uh, Brighton, uh, in Brighton Dome and Corner Chains, 
in Fusebox uh, in Brighton, and finally our London facility in our headquarters that is our catapult. These three facilities, they have 4G and 5G coverage with license spectrum from Ofcom for non-operational license uh, with uh, a number of LTE small cells, mainly airspan units, uh, 5G new radio release 15 non-standalone uh, connectivity, uh, Wi-Fi access points, either from multi-vendor basically, uh, switches, uh, some of them SDN enabled, and a very large uh, data center for about 1400 cores compute across the three sites. The three sites are interconnected, so we can see them as particularly uh, one single facility. And we have a Janet connection with a layer two uh, basically representation to the Virtus, uh, Virtus data center, which makes uh, our facility the first uh, non-academic uh, facility to, to interconnect with the universities in this initiate testbed and through the 5G exchange. Uh, there is fiber war access uh, that provides VPN uh, connectivity uh, for external use. The, in terms of software, we have a commercial uh, 4G core with local breakout from uh, uh, UK SME port tools. And we have uh, 5G non-standalone uh, cores from uh, multi-vendor uh, there from Open 5G Core and Amarisoft. Uh, OpenStack is the main virtualization uh, platform that we are using, but we, as uh, Costas from KCL mentioned and the other facilities, we have onboarded also uh, Kubernetes uh, and trying to see how containerized uh, versions of virtualization infrastructure will work. Finally, um, we are using the orchestration from OSM, uh, open source MANO, uh, with the modifications from the University of Bristol uh, to support and manage our infrastructure and also to interconnect uh, the island, the Tiza Catwalk testbed, basically, to initiate testbed. We uh, are enab uh, enabling um, DevOps, uh, so operations, in order to uh, accelerate the uh, onboarding and the install installation of the different uh, functionality that we have uh, for our testbed. So this is a high level overview of the different components that we have. Uh, from orchestration platform, as I mentioned, we are focusing on OSM. Uh, however, we have also experimented with the CORD architecture, particularly the M CORD. Now it has re renamed, has been renamed to Comac and other versions. Uh, and we would like also to investigate in the future other MANO systems like ONA. From the different services that we offer, uh, the two primary as connectivity, either 4G or, or 5G, uh, with the respective cores, 5G and 4G cores. We have the interconnection uh, to the exchange through the 5G UK exchange. Um, there are different other virtualized services like uh, NAT, video streaming, virtual routers, uh, content delivery networks that we have onboarded into our platforms. Uh, the virtualization environment uh, uses Open Daylight and ONOS as the main SDN controllers and OpenStack as the main uh, virtualization infrastructure. But uh, as I mentioned, we are using Kubernetes and Docker uh, in later stages. Uh, a very rich hardware infrastructure, physical infrastructure with a uh, number of switches, in node bees, G node bees, Wi Fi access point, a uh, lot of uh, cost of the uh, self servers. And uh, we're trying to incorporate also GPU servers to that. To manage all those, uh, we are using uh, Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring and visualization of uh, some of the KPIs that we can get from the network and also uh, Ansible and Juju uh, in order to uh, accelerate the development and the deployment of the different applications. Um, finally, I want to present, uh, as I mentioned, this was the first non-academic uh, uh, testbed that it was connected and our uh, main 
role uh, is basically to open our facility to third parties, particularly to SMEs. And we do this through the 5G test with acceleration program at, up to now. Um, we have had three cohorts. Uh, some of uh, the names you can see here, yeah, I see you are already uh, joined and you can uh, you hear us. Now, um, the focus of this acceleration program is to offer this facility to uh, SMEs to accelerate the, the, uh, the adoption of uh, 5G in their products and services. And as Initiate, the role is not only to work on the application themselves, but also within uh, the network. So we have, uh, for example, Ori, we're working on mobile edge compute, but we also have Multivision and Scenic, uh, where they're using uh, the platform as application providers for uh, immersive applications. And we want uh, to have a similar, let's say, uh, view of how we have used our own uh, testbed, the Tizakata testbed, also for Initiate and open this up not only to SMEs but to other uh, organizations like academia and uh, bigger organizations. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Let's go now, I think. Uh, Thank you. To, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. We will now uh, begin the Q&A session. And I'd like to invite all the speakers to enable the video. And uh, while Charles is going to show his illustrations again. Right. Th thank you all. I will be moderating this Q&A. And we have some uh, interesting questions already. Um, and the first one. Uh, is if uh, the initiate testbed uh, will only support IP uh, connectivity or will it also enable uh, other technologies uh, like non-IP being standardized by HC uh, non-IP uh, networking? Um, would anyone of uh, you want to tackle Jimitra, Harald? Steven, you were working a lot of uh, on IoT uh, use cases. Um, I think I'll just say that it's it's a layer two network that's created across the core. So whatever you want to put on top of that is possible. It is going, uh, is Dimitra here? Um, also, uh, I talked to you about the new exciting uh, possible, uh, I mean, uh, plan to connect with the dark fiber infrastructure as well. Um, ourselves, we are doing a lot of new protocol development and trials on top of this infrastructure. And uh, there are a lot of platforms that they are open hardware platforms, for instance, including the exchange uh, platform, uh, the, the, the course of suites that actually they're open for new protocol development and porting. Understand that the Etsy group for uh, non-IP protocols is a very new one. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we would like to talk with people involved with that group and this kind of research and see how we can host some, uh, some experimentation if a testbed needed for this. Okay, thank you. Um, another interesting question is what happens uh, after January 2021. So the project and the funding from EPSSC finishes then. Uh, what would be the facility afterwards? What are the plans for sustainability that it was uh, discussed? So, and I guess uh, this will be primarily for Dimitra, uh, Stephen and Harold, the PIs currently. Right, I can start on this and uh... Yes, sustainability is always uh, a big question for uh, testbed funding, and we have seen it again and again in funding of testbeds. And that's why in my presentation, I actually put two aspects of sustainability. The one is of the infrastructure itself. The second one is of the tools that we're developing. So quite a lot of the work that has gone in Initiate is to develop the exchange brokering facility and uh, the software stack there, which is an open source uh, tool, an open, an open source capability 
that we would like it to see to be transferred, uh, developed, you know, collaboratively with uh, other institutions and companies and community and so on and being deployed wider. And also, uh, it is also the user portal and how we develop the user portal and we can see this is a tool also that is fully transferable to a number of labs and a number of other test beds. So sustainability in terms of tools is something that we are going to be pursuing and we are pursuing also uh, with this test bed that sustainability is through adoption and co-development. This is the one. Now sustainability of the infrastructure itself going forward we would very much like to keep and grow the existing facility. We realize that after January 2021, we're most likely not going to have funding that is going to be initiate funding. Uh, however, as I mentioned, the exchange itself is going to be retained through the NDFF uh, funding and project and link also with the dark fiber infrastructure, bringing on organizations like uh, UCL, Cambridge, and Southampton as part of the overall um, connectivity of the test beds. Uh, in addition, we are actually looking at uh, the 5G test bed and trials program and the, the continuation of it, and generally any other opportunity that could adopt and use what we have created and probably replicated in other parts of the country. But this is an ongoing discussion and uh, would very much depend on opportunities for funding for the future. Thank you, Dimitra. Uh, Tritan, you wanted to comment on, on this? Um, on this <clears throat> I, I, think, um, I think I will um, support Dimitra in this. It's, uh, it's, it's a very classical thing that um, uh, happens in the UK um, continuously that there is uh, funding to effectively create tools. Those tools are taken forward uh, through sheer determination of the people involved and, uh, and they are built on layers and layers. However, um, at the moment we are in, uh, I, I wanted to point out that we are at a particular unique um, point in, in the telecoms development uh, in, in the UK where the 5G testbeds and trials program from DCMS has created quite a, a large interconnection of, of companies that are taking advantage of new advanced digital infrastructure. So under, under the 5G banner, there is a lot of, of engagement on how companies can effectively use advanced uh, infrastructure in their future. And I think uh, the positioning of a, and the building of additional capabilities from academia into the industry, it's, it's a particularly important, uh, important point. We, we are aware that there are ongoing uh, initiatives of which, uh, which can be used and take advantage of what Initiate uh, has already done and build on top of that, because particularly I like the positioning from all of the partners of Initiate. This is a 1.5 million pound, a pioneering program from EPSRC to almost, borrowing the words from Dimitra, to pilot what a national infrastructure could effectively look like. And now is the time that these kind of things should be scaled. Otherwise, we sort of see a, a, a kind of a cliff edge on the infrastructure build, whilst the tools, the instrumentation, and the knowledge that the academic and the industrial partners, the project have acquired will be going forward. But it, we should have tried to avoid the cliff edge at the end of the, of the project, of course. Okay, thank you, Dridan. Um, Harold, Steven, Costas. Yeah, if I, if I may add one comment, I mean, support of what has been said. I, I would only say that what has been developed doesn't go away, so that exists. The, the, the issue is um, how, we, how we scale it up. And for me, it's the start of a journey, we have a, a start of a very important journey to translate research into, into user communities. And these test beds, these various test beds that, that uh, um, Dimitra mentioned are very important. And in, in going forward, it, it's, uh, it's just to consolidate what's been ach achieved and take it to the next level. I mean, that, that's, that's very important. And I think it's, it's very important showcases and with the, with the examples that Dimitra and others have shown, it, it showcases that it works. It, 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 it builds in user communities and showcases new use cases. And the value for, for the SMEs is really to innovate and be competitive in the markets with advanced solutions that are that that that, that can be used and sort of the, uh, the test that can be used to trial these advanced use cases and and, and I would just 
say to everyone, take advantage of that. Thank you, Harold. And uh, following up on, uh, on this, uh, your, your answer, basically, uh, the next question is very, very uh, interesting. We have a question about from a sm very small enterprise uh, who is engaged in development sustainable multi-camera solutions to democratize production of and broadcasting, uh, making it available to those who could otherwise not afford it, uh, also ecologically or through sustainable through solar technology. However, uh, that is based in rural areas, in rural East uh, Anglia, uh, where internet connectivity is very poor, uh, and particularly for 4G coverage now, only 12 megabit per second downlink, one megabit uplink, uh, and basically sporadic cover coverage. Very difficult to carry out any R&D in that location. So our current facilities are uh, London, Bristol, uh, Lancaster, and Edinburgh. So the first question was if there is any plan to increase the availability of the test beds to in, basically target this east of Anglia, Anglia uh, England area. And if, and I guess that is uh, confirm, uh, affirmative in terms of question, uh, does initiate welcome micro enterprises? Um, in basically testing and, and uh, working with them. Uh, for the last question, I would say yes. We welcome everyone who would like to participate and, and engage with us. But in terms of wider connectivity, particularly for rural areas where there isn't uh, much of connectivity, I know that Stephen, you are doing some work with uh, the barn uh, network. Uh, but how this can be expanded, for example, uh, for access network, not just monitoring what is already there. Can I comment on this, Costa? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, micro enterprises for us at Bristol are extremely important, and I'm sure most of the partners would uh, say this, especially as you probably all know, if we are looking at the creative industry, uh, the majority of the enterprises are micro enterprises. On our side, we are working with a local organization called Watershed, which actually is a hub of, uh, that hosts uh, uh, micro enterprises on the digital creative sector. And they are actually the community that by far uh, using testbeds both locally and across uh, so, so micro enterprises, they bring huge, huge value in terms of innovation, in terms of feeding back what kind of features and capabilities we should enable in the network for future uh, media, specifically or gaming applications. Uh, the way that this is working at Bristol is that we are already established connectivity of our testbed via fiber. Uh, to this organization, Waterset, where micro enterprises would go there to tap into the network and they are doing it all the time. Um, connectivity into the initiate, probably that was not very clear. We are providing the exchange node. We are providing access to our test beds through these catalogs that we are advertising or of available capabilities for external experiment, ex experimenters. And this is a live catalog of services that we are offering. Connectivity, we are not actually an infrastructure owner. So we rely with relationships with JISC, for instance. And then we have two capabilities. One is either the experimenters themselves, they could actually list connectivity at the level that they need it themselves. For universities, for instance, they could charge this through a research grant or we have our labs open to host experimenters in our labs that they would need, for instance, to come for one week, two weeks, one month to use the infrastructure and experiment. Now, in terms of East Anglia, we actually have presence in East Anglia and uh, we have connected with BT Labs at Adastral Park, for instance. Uh, Cambridge is due to be connected uh, with the Initiate Exchange node so, so there is a footprint at uh, 
at, at East Anglia, but the facility is not a broadband service provider. Uh, it's, it's just we cannot do this. But you, anybody is very, very welcome to be hosted. I mean, hosting experimenters has been one, one commitment that we have done through this project. Thank you, Dimitra. I, if I may add to that, and I completely sort of agree with, with Dimitra, but every, having said that, the, uh, the, the Initiate has also developed building blocks for infrastructures. And these building blocks and the, the test bed, as it is now, it, it's, it's sort of is agile. It's not, not really cast in stone. It is expandable, breathable. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, of engaging with everyone uh, who, who would like to, to see it extended and then we'll need to see whether we can build a use case around it and, and, and uh, find a way to extend it. And that's, that's the way I would, would see it. Okay. And I think, uh, again, uh, this links to the next question. Um, it's around the access to various uh, layers over both the Janet or commercial providers. So how, uh, and if there is a discussion basically around how we can offer uh, the access um, uh, to different layers of connectivity from layer two to even IP, that basically connectivity uh, to over the Janet link, the GIST service that the different sites are interconnected or even commercial providers like the, uh, demo and showcase that uh, we did with BTE. Anyone would like to take that? I believe that David Salmon from Disk Janet, he actually suggested that this may be something, if there is a general interest that we can address in the afternoon. Um, and uh, if we, uh, I don't know if, if Janet would be able actually to be part of the discussion the way that the webinar is set up. Uh, but definitely there is a set of services that Janet is providing. And uh, if there is an interest, I would suggest that we take the questions and uh, actually ask uh, David Sal Salmon and his colleagues to, to comment and provide, you know, a menu of services that may be appropriate for uh, people to connect and uh, and use the infrastructure uh, thank you yeah um a bit more generic question and uh that will go mainly for uh navdi costas uh, if somebody wants to get more details uh about the testbed apart from what it has been presented uh, about the facilities, uh, what's the roadmap in terms of upgrades? Uh, where could we get that information? Uh, so, if my, if uh, may I answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, the main point of interaction or to get most updated information, even related to uh, all the services which we are providing, test beds, as well as the interconnection infrastructure everyone can log on to initiate.ac.uk website and get all the uh, details. Uh, however, if they want something more other than just what, what is mentioned over there, or if they want some deep technical details about uh, any of the test beds or kind of hostings which we can do, uh, they can always contact through the Initiate website. We have a contact page over there. And uh, like, anyway, uh, and other other details regarding the portal we will cover in our next section so that might clear some more uh, questions regarding that okay thank you everyone thank you for the questions and thank the panelists basically for answering them i will go now to the next presentations uh, on the portal from navdeep and uh, costas thank you thank you everyone thank you charles also for sharing your illustrations I will now share my screen and invite Dr. Costas and Antonokoglu and Navdeep Niyal to present. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, I am, we will start this presentation uh, with um, uh, some slides regarding uh, the Initiate web portal. Uh, and basically, 
explain how you can use the Initiate web, web portal to deploy your use cases and experiments on the Initiate uh, infrastructure. Um, and later on, uh, Nardeep will uh, do a live demonstration of the web portal uh, so you can see it live uh, in action working. Um, So uh, I would like to, for, to present now the engagement process, basically the steps necessary for um, deploying your use case. Um, first, uh, after you, of course, uh, visit the Initiate web portal, uh, you will be able uh, then to submit an initial request for interest by signing up um, on the portal. Um, in this step, there will be a form which you will be asked to complete and provide your company institution name, uh, what sites you want to engage with, and details about um, how much time your experiment will take. Um, uh, you, will, you will be able to see this step in more detail during the demonstration by Nadeep. Um, now, after the submission of request of, for interest, uh, the, the request will be sent to the consortium and the consortium will do the, the vetting to check the, uh, the background of the company uh, in case, for example, there are fake requests. Uh, and in case of a successful outcome, uh, we move to the next step, which is the feasibility assessment uh, to check the capabilities of, uh, of, the, of the testbed site according to uh, the requirements of the, of the use case uh, proposed. Uh, and the consortium at this stage will might contact the, the participant uh, for a one-to-one -on, one -one meeting to retrieve more information uh, regarding, uh, for example, the required equipment necessary for the use case. Um, now, uh, after the sign-up is approved, um, uh, the login details for accessing the Initiate portal will be provided um, and the, to the experimenter. Uh, then the experimenter can uh, upload files and images on, on the portal and it's up to, to the experimenter to um, upload the files and images needed. Uh, the following step is onboarding, uh, the onboarding of the use case uh, on the selected test bed. And of course, uh, this will require uh, technical alignment and uh, the appropriate resource provisioning that will uh, lead uh, to the final steps of the uh, proof of concept de uh, deployment. And uh, basically this will lead to the end of the experiment. Uh, this is basically what I just uh, have described uh, regarding the feasibility assessment to identify the equipment and network uh, provisioning support and uh, identify the access uh, network type. Oop. Sorry, oh, let's scroll. Sorry about that. Um, uh, the technical alignment and resource provision concerns the, uh, the recording of, uh, of equipment and network details to be used. Um, the uh, use case onboarding um, is about providing equipment and configure the network as necessary. Uh, the use case deployments by the SMEs and monitor a network, uh, uh, monitor network and devices. Uh, and then we have the end of experimentation, which basically means the return of equipment, uh, decommission of compute network resources and revoke of VPN access and uh, the removal of uh, images and snapshots from the infrastructure. Uh, right, right now, I mean, before the, uh, just to briefly mention that before the, uh, the dive demonstration uh, starts, um, we will show the registration process for the request for interest, uh, how uh, easy it is to engage with a portal and uh, uh, what is the process for provisioning for to download specific test site related access tokens. Uh, so it's up to you uh, and update now. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. Uh, we'll
Hi everyone. So I will just go through the process which Costas mentioned. So this is this is the main website of Initiate, um, as I mentioned in briefly during the Q and A session. So initiate.ac.uk. You can log in over here and you can see all the all the different tabs related to project consortium, academic partners, different test beds which we have, interconnection facility, even the Initiate Exchange software architecture. You can have a look over here. Um, and uh, more importantly, you can contact us using the contact us page. And while if you want to engage with us through the portal, which uh, the process which uh, cost us mentioned, you can um, do the collaborate with us. So once you once you go to uh, this this page, it will it can redirect you to the portal. So the initiate portal when you when you just uh, click on that link, you will land the it, it will land you to this particular page which is basically the home page over here uh, for for the initiate portal so this this will be the view you will have just the front page and the connected island so connected islands will talk you uh, through all the all the different test beds which we have currently university of bristol edinburgh lancaster university king's college london and digital catapult so uh, you can just check what all capabilities all these test, different test beds are providing. Um, in order to engage with the Initiate Consortium, you have to do the sign up first. And once you do the sign up, uh, it will take you to this request for interest open Initiate open call. There are different fields over here, all starting from your name, organization, email, some contact address, website, Company institution and um, different different uh, different details. What is most important is you should uh, and we encourage everyone to register using your institutional email ID so that it would be easier for us to do the initial vetting to do a background check on the institution and what kind of services, what kind of experiments you have done, or if. Or, or any any details which we will do during the initial vetting process. Um, the these fields there are different fields over here like uh, what kind of test what kind of um, use case experiment idea you have which you want to do on initiate and um, it would be interesting for us to know why do you want to use initiate test bed for that like you want to do a multi site. Uh, experiment or you want to do just a single site experiment and the reason behind that or or just just for us to know um, uh, the motive uh, then how well developed the idea it could be it could be something like uh, you the idea is completely ready and you just want to deploy it or if you want to do some experiments do some proof of concepts for you to develop that idea which would be useful for your organization Proposed timeline is required because for internal purposes, as um, as we know that we cannot hold the experiments forever, but yeah, def definitely we can have some kind of, uh, it, it would be interesting and it would be good for us to know how long the experiments would be hosted for so that we can allocate different uh, slots for different experiments. Um, Okay, so the equipment needed. If you need some kind of uh, physical equipment, say you want some 5G enabled phones, handsets, or you need um, some kind of specific switches, optical network devices. So what kind of, or say, say Li-Fi devices. So if you need something which you are not providing, you can fill it in over here. And uh, again, the equipment which you will bring and which you will attach to our network and do your testing, say you want to bring your VR headsets or something related to that, um, you can put it over here. Uh, if there are some additional comments, uh, do it, uh, you can mention over here. Uh, more importantly, how many number of test bits you want to uh, deploy your experiments in? It can, it can span, currently it can span from one to five because we have five number of test bits. Um, it is not necessary for you to um, decide on the first go before doing the request for interest. There might be cases that you don't know that how many test beds would be required or even if you don't know which exact test bed you want to deploy your, um, uh, deploy your services in. So um, you can fill an arbitrary number like from uh, zero to five. Uh, but for the test bed selection, you have a list of all 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 the test beds, but at at last you have one open um, 
open uh, point which is called need advice and open for all so that we can do an initial web when doing initial wedding when we contact you we can decide and we can advise you which test bed you can use once you do once you fill all these all these details you can submit your form and uh, as it is submitted it will come back to us and in background we will do all the um, all the checks um, i will i will go through the process once uh, once this initial wedding is done you will receive a sign up uh, your sign up details so that you can log in and access the initiate portal i will show you how exactly it will look like once this is uh, this process is done and you are signed up to the initiate portal um, okay so once once you are done you will find a different view with more options over here like you have the initial options like home and connected island but additionally you will have my sites and configured sites so if you go to my sites all the uh, sites which you have mentioned over here uh, will be listed so as of now there is um, you haven't selected say you haven't selected any site you need advice and open to all and your credential is not ready but in background we have added some sites for you uh, so those sites will be visible though will be visible over here uh, moreover you can once the sites are there you can um, okay you can go to configure sites as uh, as uh, initiate initiate is connect initiate can be used using the exchange software which is leveraging the open source mano uh, which is the op open source uh, nfv instances each test bed is currently hosting or you can directly use our cloud infrastructure so you have two options so if you are using uh, if you are going through the first option of virtualization uh, using the descriptors like open source mano descriptors uh, you can select this option you can select your uh, descriptor you can select the vm image and you can add your machine so this machine is like it uh, this means that a nudge will be given to the administrator which will uh, in background deploy your vms and your images onto the respective test beds whichever you have selected uh, if you're not going for this option and if you're going just directly with the cloud like you want to upload your vm images we will need some more information from you like for hosting that particular vm how many cpus will be required say two cpus are required say 256 mb of ram is required and 20 um, gb of memory is required and you can select a cloud vm suppose uh, i so at, at this point you can um, you can upload as uh, as as needed you can upload your vm over here and once once it is uploaded uh, it will it will give you a nudge that okay it is the file is successfully uploaded and you will have um, um, once this is done you will have your existing machines which you have already deployed over here you can see what all machines are running um, we have disabled this button called delete machine so that it is not done accidentally and in order to do that if you want to delete your machine and you want to redeploy something different you can allow machine deletion and uh, do the deletion process um, okay so uh, while so this is through the portal but while you are direct if you want a direct access to your machine so say if you want a um, ssh if you want to ssh into your machines or if you want to access uh, say you are hold, hosting an apache server if you want to access that how will how will that be done um, with all different sites which you have selected there will be a vpn key and credentials uh, which will be uh, which will be over here as of now it is not ready but uh, once your sign up is approved there will be a vpn key which you can download and easily you can connect to that particular site and access your machines um, so this is this is basically how you can engage with the portal and that is it from my side thank you very much navdeep and costas i'd like to now um conclude the morning webinar um right before we present the afternoon session. I'd like to thank all our speakers today, to thank all the participants today. Um, this was a great opportunity to engage with um, and understand how the testbed capabilities, uh, what the te to engage and understand the testbed capabilities. And, and now I'd like to just present what we expect to have in the afternoon session. 
In the afternoon, which begins at 1 p.m., we are going to um, discuss what it means to use the test bed. After then, we're going to hear from Mativision. Mativision is uh, an, a platinum award winner uh, SME who is, um, who is focused on personalized uh, VR, AR, and MR experiences. And they, they will present their use case. After then, we're going to have group-based discussions where we actually, we want to hear from you um, about, about your experiences, your challenges, your thoughts. So we'll have group-based discussions. And then um, we will go back to the main room, have feedback from the group discussions, and then close the session at 2.45. So I'd like to thank you all again. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you in the morning webinar and we look forward to welcome you to the afternoon session. You have received a you will receive another reminder with the link before the session begins. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you after the lunch break.